Hey, welcome to the Pillow Talk podcast. I'm your host, Will Beck. And today on the podcast, I have Drew Hanlon. Drew is an NBA skills coach. And when the NBA's best players want to get better, they call him. So Drew, I'm a huge basketball junkie. Having you on the podcast is a big deal for me. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I was excited to, uh, you know, it was exciting to connect with you guys when you guys got to stop in and watch one of the NBA open runs this summer. And, uh, you know, those are some of the highlights of, of my year. And so uh, for you guys to experience up close and personal kind of, uh, you know, the hard work that they put in in the off season was pretty cool. And I'm excited to join you on this as well. Awesome. So let's dive in. What, what's an NBA open run? So NBA open run is basically, uh, you know, it's when NBA players get together to play five on five in the off season. Um, you know, you have, you know, the ability for them to not have to worry about their coaches, not have to worry about their systems, not have to worry about fans in the stands or, you know, it being broadcast. It's just them getting back to kind of pick up basketball where, you know, they pick teams, there's two captains. They pick their, you know, five and they play five on five and whoever wins stays on the court. The losers sit out and another team of five, you know, that is picked up on the sideline comes on and uh, they do it for a couple hours. But it's really just super competitive basketball where players get to work on all the skills that, uh, you know, they've been working on throughout the offseason and also get to play freely where they don't have, you know, there's 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 no rules. There's no system. There's no you know, this player is a star and this player is a role. It's just everybody out there doing whatever they can to win. And there's a ton of friendly, you know, one-on-one -on -one battles, you know, that intermix in between those, uh, you know, lines. But um, it's just super highly competitive basketball where the best players in the world get to be their best with total freedom. So who are the, some of the guys that you have out there usually? You know, some of my clients, you know, Joel Embiid, Jason Tatum, Bradley Beal, Zach Levine, RJ Barrett, Kelly Oubre, Shimmy Oloje, those are some of the guys that I'm working with, uh, Myers Leonard, Taco Fall, et cetera. Um, then we have a bunch of other guests that come in. You know, we had Trey Young this year. We had Carmelo Anthony, uh, Spencer Didwitty. We've had, I mean, we've had so many guys uh, come in, Chris Paul, um, et cetera. So really we just get a good mixture of, um, you know, NBA all-stars, um, NBA superstars, some NBA role players, some NBA starters, and, it doesn't really matter who you are or, or what your kind of label is during the season. You know, there's so much talent in the gym and uh, they're all able to showcase what their true capabilities are. Just because, like I said, there is no, uh, you know, team system uh, that's in place. It's just, you know, are you better than the guy that's in front of you? That's, you know, that you happen to match up with on that on any given day. Yeah. I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that how good every single player in the NBA is like how, what tremendous skill level they have. What do you think separates the guys that can get to where they're the elite all-stars, the Brad Beals, the Jason Tatums, Joel Embiid's from guys that are just kind of role players? I mean, how do they get to that level? Well, I'd say there is, you know, uh, there's different levels of skill, obviously. And so some of those guys, whether it's, you know, their shot making ability is, is, you know, um, you know, high class or whether it's their ability to create their own shot or, um, you know, their ability to finish around the rim or to draw fouls or whatever. So I would say that the stars in the league, they have some kind of skill, you know, mm -hmm. Steph Curry's elite skill. He has multiple of them, but he's an elite shooter, best shooter of all time. But then he also has the ability to handle the ball and create for himself and then finish it down when he gets downhill and make decisions. we got guys like James Harden that are super crafty with the ball, you know, shiftiness, change of directions, uh, you know, being able to decelerate and stop and start. That's his, you know, elite skill. You have guys like some of my guys that are just elite scorers, you know, whether that's from the mid post or low post or whether that's from the perimeter or coming off ball screen. So I think the big thing, though, is it comes down to one, having the skill set to be able to do the things in games two have the confidence to be able to do them in games. And then three, have the opportunity to do them in games. And when those three things kind of collide, when your coach or team is giving the opportunity, when you have the confidence and when you have the skills, that's when you get those players that are able to, you know, perform at the highest level uh, just because they do have the green light and they're able to take advantage of that green light because they put in the work to master the skills they need. Who are some players right now that you think, hey, if that guy had the opportunity, 
he's got the skills, he's got the confidence, but he's just not getting the opportunity right now that they could be a star. That's hard. To be honest with you, that's hard because, I mean, you think about there's a lot of players that if they switch roles and switch teams, they would be a completely different player. They'd have a completely different value. If you think about it, um, you know, you look at a guy like Draymond Green, for instance. Yeah. Draymond Green on the defensive end, one of the smartest defenders, uh, you know, always a step ahead, always in the right position, elite defender. But offensively, the thing that makes him so good is that he's able to play off of Steph Curry. Yeah. He's able to, you know, when Steph gets doubled off ball screens, he throws it to Draymond. Draymond is playing three on two, two on one most of the time. And he has a really good ability to make that right decision. Does he lay it up? Does he throw a buddy pass to his big guy for a lob dunk? Or does he skip it out to a shooter? Now, before Draymond was there, Draymond was on the bench, not playing at all. My first ever NBA client, David Lee, was in that same role. Mm -hmm. David, for four straight years, averaged over 20 and 10, you know, collectively, was an all-star. David gets hurt. Draymond, who's on the bench, comes in the starting lineup and shows everybody how good he can be. And so that's a great example of somebody that did, you know, literally get an opportunity and had the skill set they needed to maximize that Mm -hmm. role and became who he was. You have other guys that you look at, um, you look at like, Tyrese Maxey this year. Yeah. You know, Tyrese Maxey, um, you know, last year didn't play as many minutes. Ben Simmons is not playing, is not in the lineup for the Sixers. Tyrese Maxey gets more minutes, more touches, and is putting up great numbers. And so, you know, there, there's part of that could be that he improved this summer, but there's also a good part of it that, you know, his opportunity changed. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a crazy stat a couple of years back that said that, like, when you looked at the, MB, the uh, NBA's most improved player, that like it was half of the people uh, I don't know if it was last 10 years or 12 years or whatever, but like half of the players that got the most improved award either changed teams or changed coaches. Mm -hmm. And so you, you got to start asking yourself, is it really that they improved that much or did their role change or opportunity change? And that happens a ton too, you know, is when the opportunity changes uh, you know, these players can finally showcase, I call it the Jeremy Lin theory. Yeah, <laughs> Jeremy Lin was on the bench and then Jeremy Lin went through Lin sanity where he was ridiculous, but also he was, his time of possession was through the roof. The amount of times he came off ball screen was through the roof. His usage, his turnovers were through the roof. Yeah. Like people don't realize he averaged like nine turnovers a game during that Lin sanity run. And so you ask yourself, obviously his confidence was through the roof too, but if he, You know, he obviously throughout the rest of his career, he wasn't able to perform at that high level because maybe he didn't have that same opportunity when all those other guys were down. But it's the Jeremy Lin theory of there's a lot of players in the NBA that if they had the ultimate green light, that they could shine a lot better than they currently are. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't have a specific name or two, but um, I think there's a lot of guys that, that are really good that are just one coach or one system away from really breaking through and, and showing what they truly can be. Yeah. That's the crazy part about basketball. You can work so hard and do so much, but then sometimes it's still out of your hands. You know, you have to have somebody who like believes in you and says, Hey, I'm going to make you the guy, you know? And it's like that in every other field too. I mean, think about music industry. Mm-hmm. There's some really talented musicians that are never going to make it because they never hear the right, the, they never have the right people hear their songs or the right, the people that give them the opportunity, you know, and, and it's the same thing in the workplace. You know, there's some really hard workers that are really talented individuals that, you know, work all day long and they slowly might move up, but they don't ever make that big leap that maybe they, they could, if somebody really truly got to know them just because they didn't get seen by the right person. And so that's why I'm always big on, on with my guys. I tell people all the time as a skills coach, your job is not just to improve their skills. It's also to improve their confidence because you can have all the skills in the world one on zero in a mm-hmm. workout. But if you can't trans translate all those skills into the game, it doesn't matter. And so my job is to, you know, make them really good at basketball, but then also to make them believe that they're really good at basketball so that they can utilize all those skills that they've mastered actually in games, which is when it all, was the only time it matters. Yeah, that's game changing when you're like. I'm better than somebody and you believe it and you know it, and you're just going to go down there and you have this like enthusiasm and aggression. That's like, I'm going to dominate this person. And then you do. And if you don't, no chance. 
it's so. it's weird but you think about all the best athletes in the world you think about michael jordan and i use this analogy all the time but anybody that that was a basketball fan in the 90s if you were sitting in the living room with a bunch of your buddies and the chicago bulls were down 15 after the third quarter if you looked around the room and said hey guys listen i know the bulls are losing by 15 i want to bet on michael jordan and the chicago bulls who is willing to take my bet no one would take that bet. You just knew that Michael Jordan was going to figure out a way to come back and win. You think about Tiger Woods back in the day. Tiger Woods, if he was in contention of a major or in contention of a major tournament, even if he was down a few strokes, if you said, hey, you know what? I'll let you bet on the guy that's winning and I'll take Tiger. You'd say no way because you just knew Tiger was going to figure out a way. Michael Phelps was like that in swimming, you know, Floyd Mayweather in boxing. You just knew even if you tuned in and you said, I want to watch Floyd Mayweather get knocked out, you would never bet against Floyd Mayweather losing the actual fight because you knew he was going to outbox the guy. And I try to tell that to my clients all the time, that there's a mental edge that these great ones have. And you saw Tiger lose it for a while. Mm-hmm. Tiger had it. And then when he went, you know, when the incident happened where he had that accident and some, some of life hit him and he started to not be as dominant, once a couple people started to beat him, Everyone gained that confidence. You know what? Tiger actually can lose. Mm -hmm. But before that, before he had ever been rattled, the other people just knew there was some way that Tiger Woods, you're going to hear the roars from the fans and he was going to come back and win. And so you try to get that kind of that it factor just, you know, as, as deep as you can, where players have what I call unbreakable faith. You know, they might, their, their confidence might waver a little bit. It might bend a little bit, but it never breaks. Unbreakable faith. How, how do you build that in somebody? One through mastery. When you do something enough in workouts, you just trust yourself over time. You know, mm-hmm. you just see the ball go in enough that, you know, you know, it's going to go in because I've put in the time and work. Another thing that you can do is you simulate exactly what they're going to see in the games. So, you know, for me, I put them in a lot of game scenarios and workouts so that when they're in that scenario in a game, they've been, it's almost like, in the back of their mind, they're like, I've been here before so many times. I know exactly what to do. And then the third thing is just the talks, like the talks we're having right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't know how many talks I have with my guys, whether it's on FaceTime or whether it's me going to town and spending a couple of days with them where we're just talking, you know, and we're trying to really, we're trying to remove any fear, any doubt. We're trying to remove stuff, uh, you know, remove the clouds so that we can get to the good stuff. And I think that that's the hard part is everyone has insecurity. Even these best players in the world, everyone has doubt. Everyone has, you know, what if it doesn't work out that are in in the back of their mind. And the more you can remove those and just trust that, you know, if you put in the work, you're going to get the results. And you know what, if you don't get the results, that's part of it too. You know, the best shooter in basketball history, Steph Curry, he misses 55% of his threes. Yeah. He misses 55. The best hitters in baseball, they miss seven out of 10, you know, seven out of 10 times they get out. And so when you start kind of doing that, you realize there's going to be a lot of failure that happens in this process. And that's okay. That's part of it. You can't let the failure to accept that. Yeah. When you start to accept that, that's when you can really become that special mindset player. That's awesome. One of the things that you were talking about is having people that gave you an opportunity, like, in terms of becoming an NBA skills coach, like what opportunity did you have that you were able to like nail this, you know? I had two big ones. Um, one was I was in high school and I was player of the year in Missouri and Bradley Beal started working out with me. Now, the part of the story that a lot of people don't realize is when Brad and I, when I started working out Brad, he was working out with me. Mm-hmm. I was still a high school player. Yeah. <laughs> and I was better than he was. You know, I was player of the year in Missouri. He was still you know, a, a youngster, um, I was three years older than him. And so when he was a freshman, I was a senior, that's when we started working out. And so we'd work out together. So that was a big break because I had no idea how good he was going to become. He had no idea how good he was going to become, but being able to have somebody that I was able to help from an early age, it showed that I could get players better. Mm-hmm. And so Brad as a freshman high school average eight points a game. And then the, after that summer of us working out together, the second year as sophomore year, he averaged 24 points a game and he won a state championship. So I won in 2008, a state championship. He won as a sophomore in 2009 as a state champion. 
And so he made a big jump in his game and everyone said, hold up, <laughs> what did you do last summer? And so I was able to be a small part of that, mm -hmm. which was the first time that I had a true success story to say, hey, look, what we're doing is working. And then my second big break came from, the, you know, David Lee, who was in high, went to the same high school that Brad did. He heard the, the work that I was doing with Brad and he was coming back in town just to visit his family. And he basically gave me a one workout opportunity. He told me after the fact, he said, Drew, just so you know, he said, there were so many people in town that basically were saying, Hey, you got to give this guy drew a chance. And I was thinking he's a college basketball player. Why would I listen to a college basketball player? I'm in the NBA. Yeah. He said, so what I did was I texted you and said, Hey, let's get together. Let's get a workout in just so that I could basically check off the box and tell everybody, yeah, I gave him a chance. He was okay. And I showed up to that workout. I, the cool story about this is I was in Nashville at the time when he texted me, he was like, yo, it's D Lee hit me. So I call him <laughs> and he's like, yo, I want to give you a chance. You know, I'd love, I heard you're the man in St. Louis. I want to work out with you. I was like, perfect. He's like, when can we start? I was like, whenever you want. He's like, all right, tomorrow, 8 AM. I'm like, shoot, I'm in Nashville, but I'm not about to blow this opportunity. So I work out John Jenkins, who was at Vanderbilt. He was SEC's leading scorer. I work him out. He's one of my best friends. And I say, hey, John, I got to get I got to get in the car. I got to go work out David Lee. So I drive back from Nashville. I get home at about midnight. I watch film on David Lee from midnight till 7 a.m. Don't sleep. Really? At 7 a.m. I get to the gym. I mop the floor because I want to make sure the floor was in good condition. I was like, NBA, he's probably used to these nice arenas. Mm -hmm. We're in, you know, the Shrewsbury City Center which is my local rec center. And I was like, I want to make sure this is perfect. And when he showed up, he showed up a little bit late. He pulled up in a Ferrari, a half million dollar <laughs> Ferrari. And he showed up late and I said, Hey, get on the line. You're late. And he's like, bro, bro, I'm in the NBA. Like we don't like, I, now I know <laughs> NBA time is different than regular time. I didn't. Mm -hmm. And he was like, bro, we're not running. I was like, dude, everybody that shows up late, we run. And so we, we jogged, we, he, there was no running involved, but we jogged <laughs> up and down the court. And then we started our workout. And then in that workout, there was one thing called the pound pivots where he couldn't make any. And he looked at me and he's like, bro, let's move on, man. This is, this, you're wasting time. I'm never going to use this in a game. He's like, you're just showing this because this is probably what Brad does. Like you never worked with big, he's going off on you. You never worked with big guys. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him. I said, Dave, listen, if you get your foot a little bit more at this angle, it's going to allow your hips to open up. If your hips open up, it's going to make an easy shot. Last season, you shot 33% on your right hand, 17% on your left hand on hook shots. We need a hook shot if you ever want to be as special as you can be. Mm -hmm. I got lucky. He made like six or eight in a row. After the workout, he's like, yo, same time tomorrow? I was like, same time tomorrow. That became us working together for the rest of his career. And what he told me later on is he's like, dude, I was just going to give you one chance, but you did two things. You held me accountable, and you told me what I needed to hear, not what I wanted to hear. And so those are the two big breakthroughs of getting Brad a chance to, you know, get a young player where I could actually show that I could get results. And then David having an NBA player, trust me and basically stamp me as this is my guy. Those are the two biggest breakthroughs in my career. So as a, a high school player, as a college player, what made you able to see the little things from a skill standpoint that make the difference in making the shot and not making the shot? Cause most of the time people just have a feel of the game. Like I feel it not like, Oh, I'm conscious that I need to be like, four more degrees turn this way. How did you develop that? How, did you want to be a skills coach as a high school senior, as a college player? To be honest with you, when I started my skills training career, I, I just wanted to make money. I had a car that wouldn't start, you know, if it rained or snowed, or if it was too cold, <laughs> like, you know, I had one of those cars that had 175,000 miles on it. And so I needed to make money. And so I went to try to be a referee mm -hmm. and $18 an hour is what they paid referees. I didn't have any credentials. So they said, Hey, would you coach a team? And I started coaching this youth team. And I just, I said, you know what? These are sixth graders. Like, I don't care about winning and losing. I'm just going to get them better. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on developing them for the long term. And through that, everyone fell in love with the skill development that I was doing with these players. And through that is when I started doing my academies and started working out guys like Brad and some of the other best players in St. Louis. So the answer is no, I, I had no intention of being a skills coach but I loved the game of basketball and I loved helping people and being a skills coach allowed me to do both those things simultaneously. Now saying that once I started training, I fell in love with it. I became obsessed with it. And so that's when I started breaking down all the film. I mean, I would spend 
I'm talking about in my like prime film watching days, 10 hours minimum watching film a day, taking notes every day. My, my, my college teammates will tell you my, my sophomore year in college, I didn't go. I don't think I went out one time. Really? Like Friday night. What are you doing? Watching film Saturday night. What are you doing? Watching film Sunday. What are you doing? I'm reviewing all the notes that I took while watching (laughs) film. I mean, it was literally, and, and I wrote, I think in that year, I wrote a 1200 page curriculum. It could have been more, but I, I've always, I've said it before. That was like 1200 pages. So it was around 1200 to 1400 pages that year that I wrote about basketball skill development, watch over a million possessions of basketball, just sitting there organizing everything. That was before Siri really was popular. And so I paid my roommate, Corey Schmidt at the time, he was one of our managers at Belmont. Mm-hmm. I would be watching film. I'd be talking out things. So I'd say on the pick and roll, this on the pick and roll, this you're looking to split through first. You're looking at this angle and he'd be typing everything that I was talking. And I paid him to do that. So it was just, for me, I was obsessed. And, And then once I got to start helping some of these best players in the world, my biggest fear to this day is letting someone down. Mm -hmm. So I'm just willing to do anything and everything I can to make sure that I don't let them down. So when you were in college and you were doing that kind of film work, what drove you to do that? Was that like, just like an intense desire to win more than anything else? Like what, what was your fire? I think the big thing was not letting them down. Like I just wanted every time that I was in the gym with somebody, I wanted to be able to help them out. I wanted to be able to Mm -hmm. give them solutions for problems that they were having. I wanted them to have aha moments. I just, I really crave those moments where the light bulb goes off where a kid that has never been able to do something. Finally it clicks. And they have that smile. They have, you know, I mean, it just, I don't know. For me, that's what gets me going, you know, is, is when I can see a kid, an NBA all-star or something click, it's everything. Mm-hmm. You know, last game, Joel had 42, but more importantly, he scored 17 points in the fourth quarter, but they were all jump shots, face up, jump shots, step backs, fadeaways, double team coming. I don't care. I'm going to the corner. I'm getting my shot off. After the game to hear the FaceTime conversation that we have that I'll keep private, but just basically him being so proud of all the hard work he's put in to develop that side of the game. It's worth every minute of film that I've done for him. It's worth every second on the court that we've done with him. That's what I live for. So even back then when I was in high school, even though the players weren't the same names, you know, even though it was little Jimmy and Johnny and Sally that were sixth graders, seventh graders, eighth graders, when I first started out, I, I pour just as much time and energy and effort into helping them as I, as I do now currently with my NBA all-stars. Yeah, it's pretty awesome to hear you talk about like what you put in for that because we all want to have those moments in our lives where we get to the pinnacle of our field and do these incredible things and have these like success moments, you know, where Joel Embiid is like thanking you for for what you've done for him, you know. But how many of us are willing to uh, do ten hours of film and a million possessions and just constantly dig and dig and dig for that? My favorite thing, I I literally log into Facebook every day. For, for two things. I look at the birthdays because mm-hmm. I want to make sure I, there's not somebody I need to say happy birthday to because I know how much it means to people when you just reach out. And the second thing is I click on the memories. And it is so cool for me when, you know, the other day I got one that said, I posted on Twitter and it said like nine years ago today. And it was me talking about, I just got home for Christmas nine years ago today. And I had said, I left my house October 30th and I had traveled to 15 states, had been to nine NBA games, seven college basketball games, four high school games. And it basically showed that, like, dude, I've been on this grind for way longer before people <laughs> knew who I was, before Instagram was a thing, before, like, I've been doing this before social media was a thing. And to me, it's so cool just because I think that nowadays a lot of people do things for clout and a lot of people do things to stunt on social media. Whereas for me, it's always about just being able to help as many players, coaches, trainers as possible. And it's cool when I get those memories and the flashbacks. And, I, and, and it brings me back to times where there were times where before I was financially comfortable, where I would sleep in the parking lot, you know, in my car. I did a clinic in, you know, the middle of nowhere, Missouri, and I had made, you know, 300, 400 bucks for the day. And I was like, I'm not going to waste 150 bucks to go stay at a Holiday Inn. So I'd go to the Holiday Inn parking lot, turn up my heater all the way high so that, you know, when I turned my car off, at least it was warm to get to sleep. (laughs) And then I'd wake up because I was freezing cold. 
And every once in a while, I'd get a knock on the window. Sir, what are you doing? You can't sleep here. And I'd say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm checking in the morning, which was a lie. But I just yeah. then I'd drive to a different parking lot and stay there until I got kicked out. It's just really cool to think back at those moments because now I'm able to stay in the luxurious hotels or fly private with my guys. And there was that wasn't like how it started, you know, and, and it's 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 fun for the people that were there from day one where they're like, yo, do you remember when we drove to South Dakota for a video shoot? We literally drove from St. Louis, drove to South Dakota 13 hours. We did the video shoot because they had special equipment there. Then we drove back. We had the windows just cracked just enough to make that annoying little sound. So we stayed up, you know, where we, we didn't fall asleep because we didn't have, we didn't want to waste money on a hotel. Like those are the great stories that, that I wish more people knew about. So when you were at some of the tougher times, like being at a hotel, not really feeling like you can afford to, you know, get a room. Like, did you feel like that was a low point at the time? Did you feel frustrated or tired or? No, I mean, tired for sure. I mean, <laughs> I wasn't sleeping back then. Like I still, I, I need to do a better job of sleeping even today, but I just think that I was so caught up in, I know where I'm going to get. I know where, where this is taking me that I never looked at it as a down point. I was appreciative that, you know, when I did the clinic in mid Missouri or in the middle of Kansas or in the middle of Iowa, I was just appreciative that people were giving me their time and giving me a chance to help them get better. And so there were clinics where I made a couple thousand dollars in a day. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. There are other clinics where I made 200 bucks in a day. And I was like, this is still amazing, you know? And, and I really do think that everything that I did, while no, there was a lot of stuff that wasn't fun, I always had the end game in mind of like, I know all this hard work is going to pay off. And I trusted that it eventually was going to get me to where I wanted to get to. And, you know, I look back now, and it's funny, like Christmas time is always cool for me because when I was younger, I lived in St. Louis. I grew up in St. Louis. So my birthday present, my birthday's in September. My birthday present was a ticket to an NBA game. And my Christmas present was the flight to the NBA game. Mm -hmm. That was my Christmas and birthday present combined. <laughs> now I go to, I get paid to go to NBA games. And that's my job is to literally go to NBA games. And it's funny because Back in the day, if I saw an NBA player, like it could be at a grocery store when I was younger, like that didn't happen because you're in St. Louis. Yeah. But like if you randomly like happened to be at an AAU event and there was an NBA player, you would just like run to the next court just so you could see them. And now those are all my best friends. So like there's times where I'm like, I'm trying to like snap myself back and I'm like, you, dude, you can't complain now because you're literally living your 10 year old's dream life. And so that's where I think I'm, I'm a little bit different than most. And I don't look at anything as a down point. There's been times where I've made bad business decisions that have cost me six figures. And there's other, and, and I look at it and I say, this is a great learning lesson. That's going to save me a half million dollars later on. Mm -hmm. And there's times where I've, you know, done things and, and they've really worked out and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But also I just got to appreciate the journey that I've been on. So I try not to get too high and too low just because I know that, um, you know, I, I have a quote that I always say, but like, it's my grandma's quote. She used to always say, you're never going to have everything that you want, but you're always going to have more than you need. And I always keep that perspective. You know, there's a ton of things that I would want, you know, to, you know, things I want to do in my business career, things I want to do in my personal life, you know, et cetera. And I'm not going to ever get all the things I want, but at the same time, I've been blessed with way more than I need. And so I just try to focus on, you know, appreciating all those blessings because I know that at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we showed up when we were born, we were born with nothing. So everything that we get in life is just, it's basically house money Yeah. because we're going to, we're, we're going to die with nothing too. So we're basically everything that we acquire in our life, you know, the memories, the experiences, the financial stuff, the houses, the cars, the car, all of that is, is going to be given back at the end of the day, we're going to end up not with it. So. I just try to keep that kind of perspective and, and uh, it, it helps me stay grounded. So if the cars, the money, the houses, that's not success to you. Like how, how do you define being successful? In fact, I think a lot of people with all that stuff would tell you that they defined things as success. And then when they got things, they realized <laughs> that actually, <laughs> I don't that actually the complete opposite. Yeah. So I would say the easiest way to define success is inner peace, mm -hmm. inner peace. When you are truly happy with who you are, 
that's to me success. And it's, it's when you're doing exactly what you want to do with the people you want to do it, when you're exactly where you think you're supposed to be. I mean, that's true inner peace. You know, I, I always love when, like, when people are, you know, people ask you, what are you doing? Or what are you, you know, who you are, or describe yourself, whatever you describe, if there's a gap between what you're actually saying that you're doing and actually who you are and who you feel you are, whatever you're telling them and whatever you feel, if there's a gap, that's like the unhappiness gap. Yeah. But when those things are the same, when you can confidently and proudly tell people who you are and what you're doing and you're telling them the truth, that's when you have that inner peace that, that everybody should be striving for. And I think that not many people talk about it. I mean, that's one of the big things I do with my NBA guys is I don't help them just with their skills. I mean, there's been a ton of my guys that have gone through bouts with depression and, um, you know, they constantly are battling, you know, confidence versus, you know, being down on themselves and being frustrated with situations and, and they have so much pressure on them and insecurities. And I mean, I spend just as much time, if not more on the mental side and, the, um, you know, the, the emotional side as I do with the basketball side. Yeah. I love that definition. I hadn't really thought about it, but it's just like this need to not brag about yourself and just be like, this is who I am. And I love everything in my situation. You know, that's, it reminds me, you know what it reminds me of the movie eight mile. I love the movie eight mile when Eminem at the end grabs the mic and, and says all these bad things about himself. He's like, yeah, I am this. I am that I am this. And you know, cheddar Bob did shoot himself with, <laughs> you know, in his foot with his own gun. And I'm still sitting here. And I'm good. I'm good with it. And then he's like, but I know something about you and starts voicing off all the insecurities. And then he tosses over the mic and the guy's like, damn, when, Stole when you're comfortable, <laughs> yeah. When you're comfortable with all your insecurities, how, how can I get under your skin? You can't. And I think that, I mean, that scene is so powerful because it's like the first time in the movie where he just basically opens up and says, I understand that all these things, are going on in my world, but I'm okay with that. And I think that there's not enough people that strive for inner peace, you know, that are truly comfortable with who they are and what they're doing. And, you know, I, I hope, you know, that later on in my life that I'm not known as just a basketball coach. I, I really hope that I can help people, you know, with find that inner peace and perspective in their, in their world as well. And, and that's something that uh, it's a journey I'm excited to go on, you know, outside of the basketball world as well. Yeah, that's a cool legacy to have when you can be like, hey, I left an impact and a mark on this person of, hey, I brought them real happiness, real success, real just comfort, you know, that'd be a, that's, a, that's an awesome goal. Um, so you mentioned that you don't sleep very much. How, how much did you sleep last night? Last night was a bad night, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I really don't. It's, it's funny because I've gotten better over the years. It was weird. I was flying and um i was flying on a flight this was about a year or two ago and i was flying back from dubai and i'm sitting there and i'm writing a, a book and i'm just pounding away at the keys i mean the entire flight and about six hours into the flight the lady next to me she turns to me and she says i don't know what you're working on but i've never seen somebody <laughs> work as hard as you've been working this last six hours She's like, your hands have not stopped typing. And I saw I'm writing a book, you know, I'm locked in, da, da, da. And she said, she literally asked me, she said, do you ever sleep? And I said, no. And I, at the time I was bragging about it. I was like, no, yeah. I'm, you know, you can sleep when you're dead. And she goes, well, I'm a sleep, basically scientist. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, shoot, here we go. <laughs> and the one thing that resonated with me is she said, listen, just because you can grind, she goes, there are things that like you can basically train your body to live on a certain program and you're fine. You can train yourself to be five hours a night and that'd be fine as long as, you know, whatever. She goes, but just know that if you get more sleep, you're gonna be more refreshed, so your quality work's gonna go up, et cetera. I was like, I've heard all that, you know, I'm more of a mentally just get through a kind of guy. And she's like, I, so is everyone that says that, you know, they don't understand, mm -hmm. they can be more productive. But the thing that resonated with me was she said, do you realize though that, when you're 50 years old, your cells inside your body can be 75 if you don't get the proper recovery. And that's when I was like, tell me more. Yeah. And she basically <laughs> talked to me about the science of if we burn ourselves down and don't give ourselves proper 
recovery and, and, and sleep. And so I've tried to be better back then. I'm telling you, there were nights where I didn't sleep. There were days I didn't eat. There were, I mean, there were days where my videographer, you know, would have to remind me, he's like, Hey bro, you haven't eaten yet today. You haven't eaten anything today. You know, like make sure you get some food. I'm like, Oh shoot. I forgot. I didn't eat. And so that's kind of the grind I was on. Now I've tried to be a lot better as far as nutrition wise goes, as far as making sure that I'm eating clean food, making sure that I'm really fueling my body, uh, making sure that I am getting proper sleep so that I, when I do wake up that I, it's not only about today. That's the thing that I think I messed up was when I was working, I had that long-term vision of, I know where I'm going to get to. The problem is when, when it came to sleep and recovery and food and nutrition, I didn't look at it long-term. I looked at it as I can, I can get through tomorrow. And so now I've really looked at it as of like, Hey, listen, I want to make sure that I'm healthy when I'm a, you know, a, a dad and a grandpa and, and all that kind of stuff, which is why I've started to take nutrition and sleep and recovery and stretching even, and all those kind of things a lot more serious later on. So does that mean you slept four hours last night? <laughs> last night was a bad one. Yeah. Last night was a, a four. It was probably four probably four hours, four or five hours. What's normal for you? I would say now I'm trying to get like six hours. To me, the ultimate thing that I found from a productivity standpoint, which is weird, if I get like four hours at night and then I get like a two hour nap, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, it is like a game changer. If I sleep for more than like seven, eight hours in the morning, I feel like trash. Like I wake up and I don't know if it's because mentally I feel like I've wasted part of the day or if I just, you know, when you oversleep, how sometimes you feel sluggish. Yeah. But I found the sweet spot to me is like four to five hours at night and then like an hour and a half to two hour nap. Because if I get a nap when I like if I actually sleep when I'm tired, it just helps me out. I, I just am not on a normal schedule because I'm also flying from coast to coast and internationally and stuff like that. But that's what's been the biggest thing is if I can get an hour and a half nap in during the day, which seems so childish, it like it changes everything for me. So I've been reading a lot of books on sleep and most people do recommend like a midday nap, like these sleep scientists. And so I put a, a bed in my office <laughs> so that I can just, you know, whenever I want to just go down and take a little crash 20, 30 minute nap. So it's kind of funny, but it works. So your players that you work are working with, like, do you talk to them about fitness? You talk to them about health and sleep, like how much of that? I don't focus on that stuff in the aspect of they have nutritionists, they have body specialists that do all their lifting and strength conditioning and cardio. They have therapists that do all their prehab and rehab. Um, they have chefs that prepare all their meals. What my job is, I'm mainly the skills guy. I also do all their film and analytics, and I also do a lot of their mental stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, saying that, I also realize how important all those other aspects are. So what I try to do is help them help guide those other situations. So for instance, if you have a guy that, um, you know, needs to bulk up, then I'll talk to their nutritionist and talk to their chef and say, Hey, this is what we need them to be able to do on the court. So here's what I need you to be able to do off the court. And same thing. If you have a guy that needs to lose weight, we'll be able to talk to those people and say, this is what we need. Or say there's a, you know, say there's a, a mobility issue that's causing them not to be able to do something. I need them to do a skill on the court then I'll talk to their therapists and their strength coaches and say, this is what I need from them. So basically my job is to put together a strategic outline of this is how you're going to be the best basketball player possible. And then I divide it up to each one of the specialists so that they can get them most prepared to do those things on the court. Yep. You need them to be able to do this and those guys can get them there. Yes. So what position do you sleep in? To be honest with you, I think on my side. Yeah. But do you, are you fetal? Are you like a pencil? What, what, any idea? I have to have something between my legs. That's all <laughs> I know. I have to, I'm, I'm one of those people you got, I got to, I got to cuddle the blankets. I got to stuff the blankets in between my leg. And, and to be honest with you, I also know this, which is weird, but I'm, I'm a memory phone kind of guy. Mm -hmm. it, it's weird, but I'll go to some hotels and, and I'm not just saying this because of who you are, but I'll go to some <laughs> hotels. And if they have like feather pillows, like some of the fancier hotels will have feather pillows, I absolutely can't sleep. And there's times where also you'll have mattresses that are, that are too soft and you're sinking in and I can't sleep. 
or they're too hard. And I feel like I'm laying on top of it and I'll actually end up sleeping on the, on the couch. So for me, I would actually rather have a good pillow and a good comforter than a good mattress. But ideally you have all three, yeah. but memory foam is, is my thing. And I have to have some kind of fluffy comforter. Those are my, like my two must haves. If I'm going to sleep well, I've, I've got a new comforter for you. I'm going to send it to you, but we just came out with one like a week ago. So I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll get... I mean, that's, it, it's, it's weird though. Like how you, it, it is weird how little things and uh, can, can, can change your sleep. You know, the temperature that you're sleeping at, um, you know, one of the things I am a pitch black sleeper, like mm-hmm. I've realized how the, if you turn off your phone and you get your phone away from you, how much better sleep you get, because even having your phone next to you, whatever, and I've done it, I've done a ton of neuroscience research and stuff because I'm, I'm all about the mental side, but even having your phone next to you, you're constantly thinking and you know how many times you pick it up and yeah. you feel like somebody texts you and no one texts you. It's just, you're constantly thinking about it, even if you're not. And so I mean, I, I really have tried to put my phone away. Um, you know, I make sure that it, when it's off, it's off. When I get in bed, I'm, I'm out. I used to work in my bed a lot. And I realized how bad that was from a it neurological. It teaches you to be awake in your bed. Yeah. Exactly, which is bad. So now I make sure I don't work in bed. Um, yeah, there's a lot of little things that I, that I didn't realize that I was doing that was very poor. And so, um, you know, I've tried to slowly shift and just, Again, I'm all about efficiency and maximizing every second on the court. So it's like, why not do the same thing off the court? You know, and, and so that's what I've tried to make strides in. I've definitely, uh, like I said, I've, I've fueled myself a lot better. I've been stretching and doing strength training, which I never did once I was retired. And, um, you know, the sleep component and, and hydrating. I've been, I've been hydrating so much more than I, than I ever have. But those things do make a big difference in overall performance and just the way you feel. Yeah, awesome. So what are things that uh, wake you up when you don't want to be woken up? I mean, is temperature an issue for you? Uh, just aches and pains? What, what are some of your sleep problems, if you have any? None. That's the funny thing is I actually did some sleep research. And um, because I was like, mentally I'm one of those guys that I really do think I can just power through. I really mm-hmm. do think everything is mental. I'd never have a bad day, never have coffee. I, I just wake up and I have so much energy every day. doesn't matter how many hours of sleep I get. So I did a sleep study and they were actually impressed. They said that I get to like REM, like REM four, like faster. They're like, we've never seen anybody like this. Like I go to sleep and normally it takes a while to wave. Like I get just as many REM cycles in a shorter period of time as most people do. So even in a short period of time, I'm getting the same amount of like max REM. It's, I I don't know why. I don't know if I've trained myself like that or whatever, but like when I go to sleep, I mean, there could be a fire, (laughs) there could be a fire in the house. They could be banging pots and pans. I'm not waking up until I need to wake up. So you're just good at stuff, man. You know, one of those guys who's, I don't know if that's good or luck (laughs) or blessed or whatever, but I, I really do. I mean, they were actually shocked when they looked at it, they were like, we don't know how, but the quality of sleep was through the roof. Um, but I mean, I experienced it. I don't know if it's because I just work until I like absolutely hit the wall. Um, but I will say as I've improved my daily sleep habits, I have avoided the hitting the wall as much. I used to, when I was younger, like we're talking about my, you know, the grinding days that mm-hmm. I was talking about earlier, those days I would not sleep much at all. And then what would happen was like once a month, I would just hit a wall where I'd sleep like the whole day, almost like, you know, just like literally I like couldn't function. And I realized I'm like, I'm giving back all those hours that I was, you know, kind of saving daily on that day that I can't do anything or the weekend that I can't do anything. So I will say I'm avoiding, I don't hit the wall. There's not days where I hit the wall where I can't like where my body feels like trash um, anymore, which is, which is obviously a positive thing. So we sent you a pillow cube a while back and I, the genesis of that is that I like sending out pillows to people that I think are awesome. <laughs> and I've followed you for a while. I've just been like, man, that guy's got the coolest life. He gets to hang out with NBA players. He's playing basketball all the time. He's helping them get better. I mean, it's like, to me, it's something I'm like, well, that's like a dream life, you know? And uh, what'd you think about it? Like, how was it for you? I think, I think, you know, this, but I really, I do not promote products that I don't believe in. And it's one of the things that my past business managers and my COO, they hate it sometimes because I turned down a lot of money 
from brands that try to throw money at me to promote stuff. But you guys sent me pillows, didn't pay me anything. And I still promoted them because I loved them. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've converted, there's, you know, my family members, a couple of them have the pillows and, um, you know, actually a couple of my clients, you know, have the pillows. So to me, I, I I've told you, I like memory foam pillows, but it, I, I thought it was the perfect firmness and softness. The combination is, is what I liked. And, um, like I said, I mean, once, once I like something, I rock with it. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I liked it and, uh, you know, I put a couple of my, my roommates on it. I'd say, Hey, just try it out. They'd be like, it's a pillow, bro. It doesn't matter. And then they'd be like, this is dope. Can you have them send me one? You know, like it was just like <laughs> over time. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, like I said, I mean, I've, you know, I've promoted it just because I've, I like it. I thought that, you know, it gave me better quality sleep at night. And, um, you know, like I said, uh, people sometimes are surprised at some of the things that I promote. They're like, you don't actually have a deal with them. And I'm like, no, I just like to promote good people and good products. Well, we and that's it, how man. it was with you guys, you know? Yeah. The, uh, there's something about the pillow, like that, that square shape allows it to hit on that shoulder right here and carry up that neck and head and just give you support that you can't get with a regular pillow. And I, and I'm like, I just feel it. I'm like, Oh, wow. I feel so good. You know, and it's been a, obviously we invented it. So we love it, but I, I don't know. It makes a huge yeah, difference. Here's, here's the thing shape. I'll tell you. I think that the majority, and I've been in every hotel possible. I spent 200 nights a year minimum in hotels, every hotel and parking lot. <laughs> and literally, and what I can tell you is, and sleeping on a plane and sleeping on a plane. I've, I've tried 15 different neck pillow circle donut things that you put around your neck and they all make you know i really i, I mm -hmm. experienced back pain my back every single time i walk into a masseuse they're like we've never felt a harder back in our <laughs> lives like you know and a lot of it's because of travel and what i what i've experienced in hotels though is when you get pillows what you instantly start doing is you start trying to fold pillows to get them to your liking mm -hmm. and the thing that even some of the memory foam pillows that i've tried in the past you still kind of you know, push it up against the wall so that you get the perfect like height. I didn't have to do that with yours, which was why I liked it so much. It was just like, it, I didn't need to do anything. It was just the pillow as it is was how I wanted the pillow. And so that's what I would say. The biggest compliment was you didn't have to roll it twice and stuff it once and punch it once. Like, trust me, I've done everything at hotels to make it like, you know, where you put, you put an extra hoodie in the, hotel, in, in the <laughs> you know, in the pillowcase, like, I've done everything you can to make sure that that pillow feels right. Um, but no, you guys have done a good job kind of mastering the science behind it. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on our podcast, man. I appreciate it. Like I said, you're somebody that I look up to. I'm like, wow, well, you've done a great job with your life and even getting to know you now. I look at you. I'm like, wow, he's like, has the right goals, the right, you know, vision of success. And so thanks for sharing that with our uh, audience. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Like I said, I, I, I love all the things you guys are doing in the sleep world and I love the products. And I know you guys are, just starting out. You know what I mean? Now you're starting mm -hmm. to do a bunch of other cool things. So I'm excited to, to be a small part of your guys' journey. And uh, I can't wait to hear your kind of grind stories later on. And, and, and when, when people are like, wow, I can't believe they just started as a pillow uh, when you guys have a whole kind of, you know, sleep performance company. Thanks, man. Well, we appreciate you.